Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the final session of this five day long webinar on why does disability research matter. Over the past five days, we have traversed the diverse terrain of disability studies. We have seen how it's semantic and ideological orientation has changed over time. How the social model reconceptualized the medical discourse and created a new language for disability. A new discourse that took disability out from the conscripting confines of the body and placed it within the realm of the social and cultural. But disability we again saw needs to be located somewhere in between the bodily experience of the individual and the various kinds of barriers posed by society. We also moved on to talk about disability and culture, how our understanding of culture has enhanced our understanding of disability and on the same plane, we have also seen how our understanding of disability has shaped and reshaped our understanding of culture. We also went through the critical disability studies paradigm. <coughs> we then moved on to disability and law, looking at the close relationship between the two and how for creating an inclusive society a very close dialogue between disability and law is required. Finally, we raise the question of designs. And the last statement that was made in the previous lecture was telling, accessibility is not necessarily inclusive. For it is on the one hand, stigmatizing and on the other segregating. A lot of food for thought over the past five days. Now it's time to bring everything to, should I say a conclusion and to try to imagine how the world would look like without disability studies. Yes, this is the title of the lecture that we are going to be witness to. And we are extremely privileged and in fact honored to have with us Professor Leonard Davis. Professor Davis, welcome. But before I call you onto the platform, it is my privilege and should I say more a matter of pleasure to invite Mr. Ritwik Bhattacharya to moderate the session. Ritwik has been an alumni of college and is nowadays working in the area of disability studies. He is the co-editor of uh, Reclaiming Disabled Bodies, which is an anthology of uh, Indian short stories is still in production. And the treasurer of the Indian Disability Studies Collective. Ritwik, the mic is all yours. Thank you so much. Uh, good evening, everyone. And even as Somesh spoke in terms of a conclusion, I would like to, in fact, begin on the opposite with the beginning. Uh, 
the first time I actually got to know about disability studies was, I think I must have been in my post-graduation or just completed my undergrad and was moving into post-graduation. And we were tasked by Sumesh to do certain translations of disability-centric short stories from Hindi into English. It was a fairly interesting exercise, but then we realized that we do not really know either a lot about translation or about disability studies. So one of the first tasks was to actually get down to it. And while translation is something that people work with, especially in the English literary fields, is, is something that people rather occasionally work with, and you would get uh, uh, experts about translations at the every second person you look at, disability studies was a different ball game altogether. And at this beginning, the first name that I came across was Leonard Davis. So I think it's when, when Sumay says it's a privilege to ultimately come speak to him, hear him talk, is actually that because it is with Professor Davis's the reader, the disability studies reader that I actually got. And I began this journey of, and it has been a very long, almost a decade long journey, and it's still growing, we're still learning stuff, we're still doing stuff. But that is one book that I keep on going back to again and again. If there is, if there is anything that I have to confirm, if there's anything that I know, even with the simple things that how is it that one writes about disability, I go back to that book. I do a general search and see how Professor Davis has done. So, uh, as Sume said, it's an extreme privilege. It's an honor. It's a very good luck that I'm here uh, on my way to listen to Professor Davis. But before I hand over the stage to Professor Davis, a little short introduction that I have very unwittingly and very brazenly ripped off of the internet. And just for the ones who are but uninitiated as it were. So Professor Davis, as it happens, actually has, and if, if anything is wrong, Professor Davis can always correct me, has three professorial positions at the University of Illinois. Uh, two of them are at the University of Illinois, Chicago, one of English at the School of Arts and Sciences, the second of Disability and Human Development in the School of Applied Health Sciences. The third one is at the University of Illinois College of Medicine of Medical Education. Uh, Professor Davis has done and finished all his studies, including BA, MA, MPhil, and PhD from Columbia. And interestingly, I mean, I, I'm not so sure if interesting as a factoid interesting, uh, his, he has done his PhD under Edward Said. Uh, outside of that, he is known for his many, many books, many, many articles that he has written. Uh, apart from disability studies, he is known to work with 17th and 18th century English fiction, especially the novel, the novel form. So two of his early books, Factual Fictions, The Origin of the English Novel and Resisting Novels, Fiction and Ideology, have been primarily on that. Uh, he has also been the co-editor of Left Politics and Literary Professions. But insofar as this current gathering is, is, is concerned, his book, Enforcing Normalcy, Disability, Deafness, and the Body, is perhaps the seminal, the pioneering book of disability studies, which in fact changes the way the academia approaches this idea of disability, of disability as a phenomena, and begins anew this movement to understand the very lives, the very fabric of lives that disabled people lead are made to lead, uh, are made to lead. In, in the current world or the, or the, or the current situations. Apart from that, I, I mentioned the disability studies reader. That, that has been somewhat of a Bible to go back to. He is also, I mean, among several other works, he also has a memoir. It's called My Sense of Silence and a novel called The Sonnets. He's also the co-founder of the Modern Language Association's Committee on Disability Issues in the Profession and has also been a commentator on national public radios, All Things Considered, and appeared on the morning edition of This American Life, Odyssey, The Leonard Lopatis Show, and other NPR affiliates. I think that's about it for this. I mean, it's, it's fairly, but it's unfair to sum up everything that Professor has done in this short manner, but I leave it up to him to come up. Uh, so I invite him to come up on stage uh, and just begin. Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor Davis. Mm. 
Thank you, uh, uh, Ritwick, for that very nice introduction. Thank you all for coming here from the various pl places in India. Um, I want to just begin by saying that uh, I'm I'm currently in a uh, in what we call upstate New York in the mountains in a very rural area. I've been here for a couple of um, a year and a half now, basically because of the pandemic, <clears throat> and I've been teaching online. But the closest town to me here is a town that is uh, in the upstate New York parlance called Delhi, New York. And it is spelled D-E-L-H-I. And nobody really knows why it's called Delhi. Um, they don't call it like uh, Delhi, but they call it Delhi. But um, I think it's kind of uh, interesting that we're all, we're all sort of uh, somehow connected to <laughs> that town in different, it's different incarnations. Um, okay, so uh, I, I, it sounds like you've had a very interesting conference and you've covered a lot of ground. Um, I'm not sure that what I'm going to present is going to perhaps be a rehash, I'm not sure, of um, some of the things that you've been discussing. And I do have a PowerPoint, so I'm going to share my screen now with you. Um, whoop, that's actually the wrong PowerPoint. Uh, this is the one. All right, well, then now you have to see my ending. Um, uh, okay, so I've sort of, you know, we've provocatively called this what things would look like without disability studies. Um, it sounds to me, and I'm very curious, and I'm, I look forward to the Q&A part of the conference, that, um, your, that India is, uh, you know, getting much more involved with disability studies, but I'm sure that in some ways, many of you are familiar with what things look like without disability studies, because it probably has been a fairly recent phenomenon for you. Um, <clears throat> so I, I'm going to begin with uh, talking about a little bit of, in the U.S. particularly, uh, about um, uh how disability studies came to be. And, and uh, the slide you're looking at right now is a slide of a uh, demonstration uh, with, uh, in, it's a black and white photograph with a, lots of people, uh, one is holding a sign that says we shall overcome. Um, there's a, at least three people and four people in, using wheelchairs, uh, a man uh, walking with a dog and uh, um, there are politicians that you won't recognize who are also in, in the background. Um, but, but, but the point I wanted to make here is that um, act, before disability studies, there was activism. By the way, somebody has their microphone on and I can hear a lot of background noise. I wonder if you could please turn it off. Thank you. Um, so there's a, there's a, there was an activist uh, movement in, in the United States of people with disabilities. And um, this was, I'm, I'm still can hear the person. So if you may, why don't you check and make sure that your microphone's are muted. Um, so, so the, and, I, and I think it's important to note that the, that, you know, the relationship between scholarship and um, uh, activism, particularly in, dis, in the area of disability and deafness, uh, is very important, and there's a synergy, uh, a dialectical interaction between uh, people, you know, act, the activists who uh, sort of post-Vietnam War in the United States uh, came together, as well as um, certain uh, legislative activists and politicians. Um, you may be familiar with this image that I'm now showing you, which is uh, called the Capitol Crawl. And it was uh, took place in 1990 in in the in Washington D.C. This is the very same Capitol that was just stormed uh, on last uh, January. Um, but the uh, a group of um, disabled people uh, dis uh, climbed and crawled up the steps of the Capitol in order to make known their desire for the, that the Americans with Disabilities Act would be passed. And, and although at the time it, it really wasn't that, you know, world shattering an event, um, it, uh, it, it did um, become an iconic uh, symbol of uh, disability activism. And the Americans with Disabilities Act passed in 1990. Um, the UN 
disability uh, treaty um, was really a lot of it is based around the uh, Disability Act of 1990, and uh, um, th this is the definition of disability that's in the Act. It, it, there's been a lot of problems with this definition, and it's been revised in some way or other, but basically it's that uh, disability is defined as a limitation of one or more life activities, uh, B, uh, having a history of such, and C, being regarded as, and, and the being regarded as part is actually very interesting and links up with uh, some of the social construction conversations I think you've been having, because um, under the act, if, if you're not disabled, but people regard you as disabled, you're covered by the act. So it has a kind of an expanding clause. And this was particularly relevant in the 1990s with people who were HIV positive because they weren't disabled in any sense, but a lot of people regarded them as disabled and therefore they were discriminated against. Um, here's another shot of, of the uh, Capitol crawl with a little girl uh, with, uh, with a helmet crawling up the steps and other people on the steps. And this was, this was in the newspapers 25 years later. So uh, just to show you that the activist part of disability studies it, it, this, this preceded what we might call in the U.S. disability studies. I'm showing you now a uh, slide of the cover of Radical Teacher magazine from 1995. Um, I was on the editorial, well, we actually call it the editorial collective of this magazine. And um, I believe this is the first publication in the United States that uses the word disability studies. Um, it was edited by myself and by Simi Linton, who some of you may know. Um, and um, there's a little bit, I mean, since uh, uh, we got the story of uh, um, uh, uh, how some people came to disability studies, uh, let me just briefly tell you that um, at the time, and this is why, where we get to like life before disability studies, there really wasn't a disability studies. I'll say in the U.S. Um, that what there was was there, and, I, and I, well, I'll talk more about it. There were there were certainly things in the helping professions and the medical and medical science, but there wasn't what we came to be disability studies, particularly in the humanities. And um, I uh, had the personal experience of I'm a CODA, a child of deaf adults, and my parents were deaf, and I. Um, I, as as was pointed out, my, my academic work had nothing to do with disability before then. It was about the novel and 18th century fiction. Um, and uh, I went to a conference of children of deaf adults in, I, think, I guess it was 1992, I think. And uh, I went there really to write a news story for the New York Times. I, I, I heard about it. I thought it would be kind of a funny story. I went to this, uh, to Texas, Austin, Texas. And I uh, had a series of, of kind of life-changing experiences, which led me to um, uh, led me to see that I that deafness was very much a part of my life, and that I hadn't left it behind. Um, also, as uh, as was mentioned, Edward Said was my dissertation advisor, and. Uh, um, you know, I was all, he was also my mentor and friend. And, uh, you know, we used to, his students would talk to him and, and say, look, you know, you, you know, this is, he would say like, you need to write something, you know, political. And we'd say like, yeah, that was kind of easy for you. You had the Palestinians, you know, that was the logical thing. And then it occurred to me that my, I had deafness in my family. So I decided that, um, as a result of this CODA conference that I would do a lot of research on deafness and that led me to disability. And at the same time, I was interested because of Said in critical theory and uh, post-colonial theory. And um, it occurred to me that there wasn't a book that I could, that was around that really talked about disability in the way that he, let's say he talked about um, the Middle East and, 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 the, and, and the East in general and Orientalism. So I started working on my, first, my book, first book on that. It was, it was originally gonna be called theorizing disability and it eventually was called um, enforcing normalcy. But at the same time, I was part of this Radical Teacher magazine and we had published a lot on social justice, on race and gender and class, but no one had ever, no one was even remotely interested in disability. 
So I, I decided that I would do a special issue and I got the approval of the editorial collective, but then I couldn't, I, I was wondering, is there anybody else out there who's doing this work? And I came across uh, a, a mention at Hunter College of a, uh, like a center for disability, whatever. Actually, let me show you the title page here. Um, this, the, if you look at the bottom, this, this is the introduction. This is the table of contents for the magazine. And you can see it's a socialist and feminist journal. Um, at the bottom, it says Disability Studies Bibliography by the Disability Studies Project of Hunter College. And I, I came across this Disability Studies Project of Hunter College, and I thought, wow, there's something going on there. So I contacted Simi Linton, who was the person. And it turned out that the, the project was basically a, a, a couple of folders in a, a, in a cardboard box in a file cabinet that Simi had. But we did, but she did have this bibliography. And so we put this thing together. And in some sense, I won't say it began disability studies, but it was an early incarnation of it. And there was, uh, and we wrote, and this is the introduction, and I wanted to just read it to you so you can get a sense of what things were like. Uh, this is a part of it. The higher education curriculum has not done any better th that is than the rest of society on, about disability. Traditionally, the study of disability has been isolated in the specialized applied fields, special ed, rehabilitation, psychology, healthcare. And information there, usually available only to majors in those fields, is concerned with remediation, treatment, care, and cure. Further, that curriculum has been developed from the perspectives of the clinician, teacher, or practitioner, and perpetually casts people with disability in the role of patient, student, or client. Disability Studies offers an alternative framework, one focused on social and political variables that shape these roles and their interactions. The dilemma for Disability Studies scholars has not been in documenting the social construction of disability. It's been in negotiating obstacles encountered when attempting to relocate and reframe the study of disability in the academic curriculum. And that's probably me really complaining about the fact that it was so difficult at that point to teach disability study, to teach anything about disability outside of the, you know, the helping professions. I'll continue reading. Efforts to locate the study of disability in the liberal arts are thwarted in part because the academy is entrenched in a particular vision of disability, one so focused on its biological or medical property, properties that the study of cultural representations and social practices is rarely considered. It may seem like business as usual that the perspectives of people with disabilities are not present in the traditional curriculum. But what is even more confounding is that these perspectives have been marginalized in the discourse on diversity and pluralism. So, I mean, that you can see from, you know, what would life be like without disability studies that this was what it was. Um, there, there, you know, there was lots of discussion about diversity and pluralism, but never, almost never, a reference to disability. And it's been a long, hard haul slog to get disability in the U.S. anyway, in academia, to be uh, a, a, a field of study that has respect and that has uh, adherence. And it's still the case, pretty much, that um, there's almost nobody who does disability studies in the Ivy League. Uh, it's beginning to happen. There are a few people, but th there's no courses. There's no programs. Uh, they tend to be in the state universities and in the community colleges. Um, and that tells you a lot. OK, this is not a very good picture, but just so you get a sense of how long ago this is, uh, this was the, the first. Um, so in the Modern Language Association, which some of you may know is the largest organization of the humanities in, in the US, um, we, there was a, uh, uh, an attempt to get the organization to make the conference more accessible and to make uh, intellectual life more accessible. And this was the first committee. Um, I'm the person on the left. And if you see what I look like now, you can see actually how long ago this was. Uh, and the other people you may or may not be familiar with, uh, Sharon, um, you may know uh, um, uh, David Mitchell and Sharon Snyder on the right, and Rosemary Garland Thompson was taking the photo. Um, what was interesting and important about this was to show that um, accessibility is actually something 
that goes way beyond uh, simply having ramps and uh, you know uh, sign language interpreters, which are extremely important. But uh, the what we discovered in the course of this meeting was that the Modern Language Association has a bibliography and also contributes to the way that libraries organize knowledge. And um, we discovered that, that it was virtually impossible to research disability because of certain kinds of frameworks that were set up within the library system and within the M MLA's own categorization. So for example, I mean, the, you know, if you wanted to look up about, um, uh, let's say people who were had physical or some kind of mobility impairments or, or you, you know, uh, didn't have arms, legs, and so on, or were blind, you, 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 you virtually couldn't look it up because the books from the past, like there was one book I remember, it was called Crippled Saints, and it was a book about, you know, various saints who had disabilities. Um, the word cripple was not allowed in the Modern Language Association uh, 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 library sorting system. So if you looked it up, you would never find this book because cripple was considered a derogatory term. And a lot of the terms that were used in the past were now considered derogatory. So we're talking about a kind of Foucauldian way of organizing knowledge that had been organized in such a way that you really couldn't research uh, disability itself. And that was part of the work that we did. Um, these are three books that came out roughly around the same time. There was my book, Enforcing Normalcy, which I mentioned, um, Simi Linton's book, Claiming Disability in 1998, and Extraordinary Bodies by Rosemary Garland Thompson in 1997. I would say these three books kind of launched disability studies in the humanities in the US. Um, I'm not talking about the UK, and I'll, I'll come to talk about the UK a little bit in a moment. But uh, so you can see that this was the kind of formative period, but, be, but there really were no academic works about disability before about 1995 of this kind that now could be considered possibly critical disability theory. Um, so uh, I'm gonna skip through this because you know it, but this at the time, this was the mo these were the models. There was the charity model, the medical model, uh, and the uh, social model. And I'm sure you're all familiar with it, so I'm, I'm just gonna skip through this. But just to say that this was the kind of the operative model at the moment. Um, there's, there's been, a, as you know, changes to this, the, the clarity of this model was very helpful, but there have been changes to it to fit in more with certain kinds of reality. And if you want to know more about that, we can talk about that. And there was also the, fun, and, and the other fundamental aspect of the disability studies at the time was the disability impairment divide. So the idea that an impairment is a physical or mental limitation, lack or inability, and the and disability is the effect discrimination. This all comes from the British model. And this is where I want to talk about the US versus UK. Uh, so I mean, I, preceding the work that, that was done in, in, in the disability studies in the humanities, there was a, there was a robust disability uh, studies going on in the UK, certainly from maybe the late 1980s to, to into the 1990s uh, and beyond. And uh, the proponents of this were people like Colin Barnes and Michael Oliver um, and Len Barton, uh, to name a few. Um, the difference between the UK and the US model was that um, uh, the UK one was basically uh, okay, good question. Where would On Ugliness by Umberto Eco be placed? I'm not sure. That's a good question. Uh, um, do you know what year that came out? And I, uh, I think that there were certainly works that were done on issues like uh, ugliness and, and facial deformities. And, but, I, but I think that these tended not to be, and I haven't read the Umberto Eco, so I could be totally wrong on this, but they tended not to be sort of disability-centered um, they may have been about aesthetics. They may have been about um, uh, a gro the grotesque, uh, but they certainly weren't written by people with disabilities, and they and 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 they weren't part of a kind of liberatory movement. Um, and I just wanted to say that the UK model was basically a, an essentially Marxist model, uh, 
which focused on the fact that disablement was a negative thing and that it was something that could be applied to people with certain physical or, or uh, mental disabilities, but also could equally be applied to working class, to uh, people of color. In other words, any group of people could be disabled by uh, the society at large. Um, and, 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 and there's a certain validity to that. Uh, the US model is really one that centers more on civil rights. And you know, because of the history in the US of the civil rights movement in terms of people of color and you know, uh, LGBTQ and women, which had all preceded the disability studies activism uh, or were coincided with part of it, um, US focused on civil rights and, was, and did not have a Marxist analysis. So in the US, the word disabling, disab being disabled was a positive term. In the UK, it was a negative term. In the US, it was a positive term. And it fit in with the whole uh, black, you know, black power, uh, gay pride uh, notion that, there, uh, that this was an identity and that this was an identity that um, should be celebrated. So uh, that caused the kind of rift. Um, there, you know, there are famous stories that involve me and Colin Barnes uh, having conflicts over this, but um, that could be for, you know, if this was going to be a conference where we would sit around and have dinner, I could tell you some long stories, but since unfortunately the internet doesn't allow that. Um, uh, and, and I would say that critical disability studies, which you had mentioned, uh, uh, is an amalgam of the two models and trying to find a common ground between them. I would just say also that the US uh, model of disability studies is much more heavily influenced by uh, critical theory, and whereas the UK, as I said, was more Marxist theory. Um, so it wasn't that there were no problems with the early disability studies. There were a, a, a lot of problems. And um, one of them, I mean, here are a few of them. There were very few black and brown voices in disability studies, well, virtually none. I mean, I, in the first, uh, uh, you kindly mentioned the Disability Studies Reader. In the first uh, edition of the Disability Studies Reader, there was one article by a student of mine whose name was uh, Sanjeev Upriti, uh, who wrote about um, who wrote about uh, Salman Rushdie's um, novel. Um, uh, and and then in the second edition of the Disability Studies Reader, one of my other students, Chris Bell, who was African American. Um, uh, had an article uh, in which he said he laid out and very early on that disability studies was very white. Um, but just a quick question in here. Uh, I hope you don't mind if I answer some of the chat questions. I mean, it might disrupt the flow, but if I wait till later, uh, I, I, you give me. Uh, or, or we can just wait till the end of the talk and I'll okay, just but, go through it. Yes. Okay, let's do that. So. But I am aware of the questions, and thank you for putting them in there. Um, so uh, the other problem, so Chris Bell's article, which was a, called a modest proposal, was basically saying like, "Hey, disability studies is white, and it needs to not be." And and I would say that in the last twenty or thirty years, the attempt has been to increase the number of black and brown voices. The other thing is, it was centered in the U.S. and the U.K. Uh, and it didn't have a, a wide reach. Uh, we didn't get the uh, global perspective. Um, very little attention was paid to cognitive and affective disorders. So it was more about physical disabilities, blindness, deafness, mobility impairments, um, because those were the people who were tending to be the scholars who were doing the work. Um, and it took a while before cognitive and affective disorders uh, came in. There was a split, and there still is to some degree, between deaf people and disabled people. Um, we can talk more about that if we want to, but uh, you know, the deaf community at the time did not see themselves as disabled. Uh, they saw themselves in the, in the, as, a, as a linguistic minority um, in the US and didn't want to be associated with uh, disability. Um, there, there was the conflict that I mentioned between the UK and the US, and the conflict between Marxist and critical theory approaches um, yeah, so we can talk more about that in the Q&A. Uh, since that opening, that beginning, um, disability studies has become very tied up with identity politics and social justice. So uh, LGBTQ, uh, feminism, Black Lives Matter, hashtag Me Too, 
and generally intersectionality has become a focus of disability studies. Um, these ha this has been very positive in some sense. I, I also think that there are some issues and problems with the, with this. Uh, notably, um, well, I'll talk more about that at the end. But um, for those of you who are interested, uh, I think the just the on the issue of intersectionality that while a lot of people pay lip service to intersectionality, we still have a problem that disability does not get included in uh, in intersectionality often enough. And I'll just leave it at that. Um, we're also one of the big uh, sort of things that have changed is a, a greater interest in uh, cognitive and affective dis disorders. Um, uh, there's been a huge push in the last 10 years about neurodiversity, uh, which really uses the language of diversity to talk about the way that people's uh, brains are organized or their brains and nervous systems. Uh, so to, to say that there isn't like a necessarily a disease entity in some of these things like autism, Tourette's, ADHD, bipolar, uh, dyspraxia, dyslexia, which is in other way, a words for stuttering. Um, and uh, that these are not necessarily like conditions that are uh, medical, but that in fact, they're an aspect of human diversity and that uh, we need to understand that better. And that the people who talk about this and our proponents should be people who are from those communities and not practitioners from the outside. Um, there's been a kind of a movement away from people first language. So when we say a person with a disability, uh, we are now moving toward disability first language and say disabled person. I mean, this is part, I don't know if this was in India, but in the US in the 80s, there was a movement toward person first language. So the idea wasn't that you were a, you were a person of color, you were a person with a disability, you know, you were, but you were a person first. But I think other people now have felt like disability is an identity and therefore you should lead with disability first language. The other uh, thing that's developed in disability studies is something called crypt culture. And um, this is related or linked to queer, uh, the development of queer culture. Um, and crypt is kind of like, a, in my mind anyway, like a replacement in disability uh, arena for queer. And it means, you know, it, it signals that it's not simply a passive, uh, um, identity, but it's one that's active, that's transgressive. Um, you can see here in the language that's being used, the idea is to be outrageous, to be transgressive, um, uh, to, you know, and obviously to uh, not like the, the concept of pity, but uh, this is not exactly, you know, it's to sort of shake up the academy with these, uh, with these stronger terms. Um, also, autism has become more obvious. Uh, the discrimination against people who are deaf or hard of hearing. Um, there's a whole separate development in that area. Uh, the other thing is uh, linked to the neurodiversity is MAD studies, uh, which is really coming in in the last few years. Uh, these are the study of, of madness, um, deliberately not using the term mental health, but going, you know, mad, using the term mad in the same way that crip is being used as a kind of transgressive term to adapt and take on the, um, the, the, the terms of opprobrium that were being used against a group. Uh, so here are some images of uh, mad studies, uh, uh, Vermont psychiatric survivors, mad studies in Birmingham, uh, where a woman of color is saying, you seriously want me to come back voluntarily to help you improve services after my last experience here? I might be mad, but I'm not that mad. Um, and it, also this is a part of a group of people that used to be called or the consumer movement or the survivor movement. It's an effort by people with, with uh, I, don't, I never liked the term mental illness. I don't know why I allowed that in here. Uh, by people with psychic distress is what I like to say, to establish control over psychiatric treatment, to combat stigma, to acknowledge diversity among people with psychiatric illnesses, and to develop systems of care that reflect diverse needs and wishes of the mental health consumers. Consumers because they consume psychiatric services rather than patients because they're passive 
recipients. Um, there's also a couple of uh, organizations, the Icarus Project, which uh, is, about, is about depression, bipolar depression. And you can see from their terms, they navigate the space between brilliance and madness. The Hearing Voices Network for people who hear voices, uh, it's actually an international uh, organization. And Mind Freedom, these are just three organizations that uh, are empowering organizations for people with psychic distress. Um, there's also been a, a recent interest in animal studies and disability studies. Uh, there's uh, Sonora Taylor's book, Beasts of Burden, Canadian Journal of Disability Studies had a special issue on critical animal studies and disability studies. Um, the main ideas are that disabled people are treated as non-human animalistic and they should be treated as full humans, that animals are treated like disabled people. So let's consider them as if they were disabled people. Don't eat animals. Farm practices disable animals. Speciesism is like ableism. Uh, this is from Sonora, Nora Taylor's book. I'm going to just skip it because I think I'm getting short on time. Uh, um, so now I'm looking more to the future uh, in disability studies. And one thing with is the pandemic. Uh, worldwide, uh, everyone's experienced this. I, I hope none of you have lost people, but many people have. Um, and so uh, with the pandemic has come eugenic concerns uh, because with limited resources and triage uh, protocols and vaccination protocols, the fear is that people with disabilities have been uh, even more discriminated against. Um, so uh, one of the things I think that's being debated, at least in the US, is should people with disabilities be at the front of the line or the back of the line? Um, when it comes to limited resources with beds, uh, uh, ventilators, um, ser and services, uh, there are there were actually some states that came up with protocols in which you would assess the uh, importance or vi valuableness of a life. So we go right back to all these eugenic concerns and you know and language almost from the Holocaust uh, about um, lives worth living and. Uh, and on the other hand, there are ethics, bioethic communities that are uh, against those kind of protocols and also question whether maybe people with disabilities should be the first on the line to get, for example, a vaccination because they are the most vulnerable. So these questions have become public health issues. And as uh, was pointed out in a way, uh, um, I, I, did, I, ha I did write and talk about uh, the fact that people with OCD, for example, uh, those behaviors that were seen as non-productive and, uh, you know, medically uh, con of medical concern are now procedures that we're all doing, you know, masking, washing our hands, uh, being extremely careful about uh, the, uh, the viruses that are around us. Um, also, the other side of the disability in the pandemic is that uh, um, some people with disabilities can't wear masks, for example. Uh, they may have to uh, abide by healthcare visitor policies that exclude support persons. Uh, some people have, are inaccessible. They can't use health, telehealth tools that are inaccessible to them because they're blind or they're deaf and they're not captioned or with interpreters. Um, let's see. I'm just, uh, there are negative consequences resulting from social distancing for some people who need extra care or require caregivers. And then there's lack of access to COVID testing and testing sites. Um, so here's a, my last uh, slide uh, where I'm talking about the future of disability studies. And um, I think the first issue is the global, um, which is why I'm so excited to talk at this conference. Um, disability had kind of started UK, US, a little bit of spread to Europe, but uh, the, the, uh, now the, the studying of disability, the writing and studying of disability uh, has become more global and, and that's gonna change the very nature of uh, what disability studies has been. Um, so we, you know, one of the things means that this is the end of the dominance of the North uh, in terms of uh, intellectual, a certain kind of intellectual colonialism and imperialism. Uh, and what we're going to get now, and I think it's happening with you, is a local, national, regional conceptions of disability. And here I'm thinking about some of my graduate students. You may know Shilpa Anand, uh, who was one of my students, had written the first 
time that it even occurred to me was her doctoral dissertation where she talked about the fact that disability was very different in India and the word disability was not even a good word. Um, I've had other graduate students who have written stuff on uh, deafness in Ghana, where I kind of learned that there's most of the deaf people in Ghana don't speak any sign language and therefore are trying to work with them in terms of prevention of HIV and other diseases was very problematic. I, I currently have a, 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 a graduate student who just got his PhD from Singapore, uh, who uh, ha has written really a very clever and interesting book about the problems of not a you know in most countries the question is that disability is excluded in Singapore it's included but it's included in this way by the government that's problematic so I think that we're we're going to come up with a, a much better vision of disability as it becomes uh, the study becomes global and we have more black and brown scholars um, the other thing is the work that I'm doing right now is about poverty and I think there hasn't been enough work on the relationship of disability and poverty. And I'll just leave that at that net for now. The other issue is uh, colonial and settler harms. Uh, people are now talking about reparations for people with disabilities because of uh, c colonialism and settler uh, culture and the harms that were done to people. And that also includes uh, enslavement and the disabilities that were caused by enslavement. And we haven't thought about enslavement in terms of disability in any you know strong way and now there are at least two books that are have come out recently about that climate change is obviously a huge uh, issue and i think disability will fit in with that as well as war immigration and displacement so i think these are this is the future of disability studies in my mind i'm sure there's more things that i haven't covered but i just wanted to put those out for you and thank you for um, for uh, this uh, opportunity. Thank you, uh, Professor Davis. Thank you so much. I think uh, I think I will not spend a lot of time in going back to what Professor just said. And we can move on to the questions. Uh, you can type in the questions in the chat box or click on the raise hand button, which is available on Zoom, and we will but in the meantime, I think we already have one question that has been put on. Uh, the difference between civil rights and Marxist model, as in not if civil rights are byproduct of Marxism. Right. Um, so <clears throat> um, I guess the so the Americans with Disabilities Act, for example, is an act that gives a grants rights uh, to people or or emphasizes the rights that were sort of in the in other legislation but wasn't weren't so dramatically placed but a right it doesn't transform society uh from the point of view of a marxist it doesn't change anything about the economic realities of life so i mean one of the things that i said in the in the book that i, I wrote a book uh called enabling acts about the, which is the history of the uh how the americans with disabilities act got to be passed and um you know, I, I was to counter or to deal with this thing. I said at the end that the Americans with Disabilities Act gave people with disabilities the right to be exploited, just like everybody else. So I mean, the point is that it, rights are very good and powerful, but unless they include, uh, from the point of view of a Marxist, uh, economic. Uh, rights, then th that doesn't uh, change the 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 unlevel nature of the of the playing field. Um, I also think that civil rights don't deal with um, social justice. I mean, I think that's one of the reasons that the term social justice has been conformed uh, 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 developed, because um, you can have a, you know a textbook case of rights uh, that are allowed, but still be shunned. Uh, in many contexts, socially, um, that justice has to have a social component to it, as well as an economic component. And um, so, so I think those are the differences that I would point to. I mean, if that's not clear, let me know. Should I just go ahead and look at the yeah, chat? Yeah. Yeah, that works. So the, the next question on the chat is on the intersectionality. Can you expand a little on the field of feminist disability studies 
or the politics of appearance, a, a concept developed by Rosemary Thompson. Um, yeah, so uh, I, I, Rosemary Thompson's done, you know, done a lot of work. She's actually currently now uh, become a bioethicist, which is interesting. But um, so, uh, you know, obviously in feminist uh, theory, I, I, by appearance, I think, you, do you mean about the way that appearance uh, can lead to discrimination, like physical appearance? I'm assuming that's what you mean. Um, uh, so yeah, there's a whole sort of like, you know, body of knowledge about uh, staring and seeing and being being reduced to an object visually. Uh, uh, that's that that is part of that. My, my point about the intersectionality is more, uh, I, you know, I'm obviously the concept that we're we all have multiple identities that intersect with each other is is an, an, an important one. Um, the original kind of notion of intersectionality was really very much linked to black women in the United States and elsewhere, and sort of saying that the law, the laws that were written, didn't allow for this intersection of race and gender, uh, along with, let's say, civil rights or, or law. Um, it's come to mean a lot of different things. But one of the things that uh, I find frustrating, that frustrates me, is within the kind of intersectional language in the US, uh, one is sort of like, it's like an etiquette. Like one shouldn't say that my group is more discriminated against than your group, but that we're all fighting for the same things for a variety of groups. And so, you know, no hierarchies of discrimination. But I, I think that somehow that, that, that doesn't allow us to say something like, yeah, but you are not considering disability enough. Because then that seems like you're saying like, well, we're fighting all the same battle. Why are you pointing this out as a, as a limitation? But that, that, that is a frustration because so often you'll see people talk about race, class, and gender, and they won't talk about disability. Or if they talk about disability, it's just lip service. Um, like they might talk about disability and there's no sign language interpreter present in the conference. So like, you know, what's the connection between the intersectionality and a true intersectionality that would really include disability? Um, Okay. Uh, there's a question. There's a question uh, that Shreem asks, which is connected to that. Problematizing can we problematize the concept of gays and stare within feminist disability? It's linked to this idea. That yeah. No. I wish Rosemary were here so she could answer this question way better than I could. Um, the look there. There's a whole like complex language and dynamic around looking and seeing and, and gazing and staring. Um, it, it, as I said, Rosemary Thompson's book on staring would, would be the go-to book for that. Um, uh, there's an issue that she talks about, about why do people stare at people with disabilities if they have visible disabilities? Um, and that's, that's a complex thing on one hand, it's it's a it's, the stare can reduce someone to an object or to a kind of a freak show uh, participant, but the stare is also you know and and of course the gaze and the stare implies that you can see and that you're not blind. So there's a whole other uh, way of thinking about this, but that the stare and the, is uh, also information gathering. I mean, we gather information through our senses, and humans are information gatherers. So the question is, what is the kind of flavor or the tone or the nature of the gaze or the stare? Um, and that really co comes back to the social construction of whatever it is being, that's being stared at. Um, and whether the stare is a, you know, what, what kind of message it's trying to convey. Um, so how does disability fit into the feminist notion of the gaze is really the issue. Is it, it you know, because a lot of times staring in, fe in, in feminist gaze is about, you know, an unwanted object of, of, of attention or desire. And in disability, it could be that, but it's also obviously very different as well. I'm, I'm not sure that I'm doing a good job of explaining it because this is kind of, I feel like I'm reaching, it's not some of the work that I've done. So I hope I covered that to some degree. Um,
Yeah, this is, I think this is more of a comment, but thank you for the comment about the intersectionality in relation to poverty, poverty and social justice. I, I, I want to say, because I'm working on this book about representations of poverty now, <clears throat> which I hope will be out maybe within a year or so. Um, and one of my main points is that, uh, you know, academics in general um, don't come from poverty. And uh, therefore, they tend not to focus on that issue, or if they do, they do it in a kind of lip, you know, just a kind of lip service sort of way. Um, I think this is true for academics with, who do disability studies, that it, it, it's taken a while to pay attention to, issue, to genuinely issues around poverty and disability. Most disabled people are poor. Uh, in, the, in the United States, something like 75% of people with disabilities are unemployed. Uh, the average income in the United States for people with disabilities is like 12,000 a year, $12,000 a year. I mean, we're talking about extreme poverty. And that's like that's with government assistance. So, um, so I think that that you know the, the shift to the global, which I'm seeing and I'm hoping for, is also a shift from bourgeois, let's say, middle class uh, perceptions about disability to to uh, a greater attention to the vast majority of people with disabilities who are in fact poor, and it is an issue of social justice and economic justice. Um, Okay, what's the next question? Could you help uh, before me? That, yeah, yeah. Before that, there's a question that Rachel Ruthing has asked about the future of literary disability studies. Where is it heading? What are the questions? Where is that headed? Well, I think in the same direction. I mean, that I said, I mean, literary disability studies will, will always kind of be in lockstep with disability studies in general. And I think, um, you know, I think everybody's, people have moved way beyond thematic you know, literary dis literary studies, so like, you know, thematic and character studies, to looking at social structures and the, the very nature of uh, narrative and reading and writing itself. Um, so I think that, that, that probably is a direction. I mean, certainly we're seeing much more uh, in literary disability studies in the US uh, about black and brown people um, and, uh, you know, uh, that that's become very, very important. Um, as I said, disability studies have been white for a very, very long time. Um, that's tied up with identity politics. And so that's one aspect of it. But I, but I do think that uh, linking, uh, you know, literary structures to social, political, cultural enterprises uh, that re that is part of the sort of larger construction of disability is really where literary studies is going or should go or might go. I'm always a little wary, you know, like, because, you know, people ask you questions like this when you give a lecture like this. And I, you know, I, I think it's important to understand that the speaker, i.e. me, is not a prognosticator of the future. I have probably no better ability to tell you what's going to happen in the future than you do tell, to tell me. I actually would like to hear from you about what you think. Um, and, uh, I once saw a study that 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 analyzed like uh, um, experts in fields about their ability to predict the future, and it turns out they are fifty percent accurate, <laughs> which is a coin toss. Uh, the next question Shivani has asked. It's about so I'm just reading it out. My concern is how far people around the globe accept disability of fetus without any discrimination. For instance, the Indian government has banned sex identification of the fetus, but permits physical scrutiny in terms of the impairment disability under hegemony of Nagus. Is there any movement of or activism regarding justice towards fetus with a disability? Yeah, this is such a complicated topic. Uh, Madhvi, thank you for bringing it up. Um, so sure. I agree, you know, I mean, there's a, there's a, a, a kind, you know, let, let's just not talk about fetuses. We can even talk about embryos, um, because given the, uh, um, the fertilization technologies, pre-implantation technologies that we have now, um, people can make decisions on which embryo they want to have implanted, uh, which itself is a kind. And so, what what you're saying is like, is eugenics alive and well now around issues of uh, abortion and pre-implantation uh, um, uh, technologies? And the answer is yes, uh, that, that we're very much uh, discriminating against 
uh, 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 disability in this process. However, you know, I don't know what the, uh, the attitude toward abortion is in India, in America, it's very fraught. Uh, and um, uh, I, I think for people, feminists and people on the left, uh, the right, a woman's right to choose is paramount. So um, the, qu the question you're raising is like, is the woman's right to choose paramount to the extent that she can uh, decide whether or not to have a disabled offspring? Um, and I don't know that that question has been resolved. I mean, I think that in the US, the way to get that people get around that is to say, like, we don't want people to discriminate against disability in any format, but ultimately it's uh, based on the woman's right to choose. So kind of, uh, you know, cutting the baby in half, and <laughs> it's probably a bad analogy, uh, with, uh, you know, King Solomon's decision. But um, I think my point of view on this would be that we need much better education for people uh, who are about to have children uh, on issues around disability. Um, so for example, in pre-implantation uh, or, or in amniocentesis uh, analysis, we, get, we have geneticists who talk to people and say, look, you're gonna have a deaf baby, for example. Um, but you, and then they can counsel them on whether to have that baby or not, or to choose that embryo or not. But um, I think what's really important is we need to have counselors who are there, not just geneticists, from the communities that are involved in those disabilities. So to have a, a, you know, a deaf person come in and say, look, you know, before you make that decision, I am a deaf person. I live a full life. I'm very, uh, I, I would, you know, I would advise you to have the deaf child. So, th so at least there was a conversation about this rather than simply, oh, there's a birth defect. Uh, let's not have that. Madhavi has a follow-up, I mean, a second question as well, where she wishes to ask if there's a need to also incorporate disability studies within the historical literary movements as well. So 18th century studies to, that should incorporate texts about disability that would show the historical variations, definitions. Absolutely. Yeah, it's just, that's a complete yes. Uh, there should be, and they're in the U.S. There is. Um, we're seeing more. Uh, there's a there's a scholar named Jason Farr who's uh, written a book about deafness in the 18th century. Uh, there's a lot more work on disability studies in the 18th century. So yeah, absolutely, that historical work needs to be done. Uh, before that, Shada Devi has asked if there's a need to change the attitude of disability studies or people who do disability studies and take it out to society rather than just limited within the participations or limited to participations within the academic circles that we want to Yeah. So our, I guess that question is like, should the, the information or knowledge from disability studies go out to the larger community? Is that the question? Yes. Yes. Yeah. The answer that that would be yes. And I don't, this is why I started out talking about activism in the U S because there has been a robust um, interaction between uh you know, theory and praxis, I guess, is what we'd call it in Marxism, right? Um, and that the role of the intellectual, in some sense, is to formulate uh, questions and answers um, that then could shape uh, political action, but vice versa, uh, the political action can and should shape the way that the intellectual um, thinks and considers about the questions that they're dealing with. I mean, for example, I'll just give you like a, a, a minor anecdote, but I was giving a kind of a wonky uh, presentation um, at the Disability Studies Conference a, a few years ago uh, about, you know, I, from my book, The End of Normal, where I was like talking about, you know, normality. And it was, it was kind of like a, a theory driven sort of talk. And a woman got up at the end and was really angry at me and said, look, I'm poor. And I, I didn't understand a word you said. I, I spent my money to come to this conference. I didn't understand anything you said. It was meaningless to me. And she was cursing. You know, it was like she was really angry. Well, that affected me. And it made me think like I should do some work on, on poverty. Um, and I came from a poor family. So, you know, aside from being deaf, they were poor. And uh, that's been my work. So th there can be this profound interaction between not just one way from academia out, but the academics have to be willing to 
listen to and, and participate in the politics that are involved. So yeah, that's the role of a public intellectual and we all should be public intellectuals as much as possible. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Sumit Garg wants to ask a question. Sumit, if you can just... Yes, thank you, Rizik. Uh, yes, uh, good evening, Professor, uh, first of all. And uh, see, uh, my question is basically, I want to, you know, uh, it's, it's a uh, quite a huge kind of a thing which I really want to ask. Like, uh, we generally associate, uh, as far as the Marxist model is concerned, when we talk about disability, we generally say that it is the material condition of the society, material conditions of the society, which actually, you know, add to whatever superstructure that gets constructed. Like, and uh, uh, Vic Finkelstein, uh, a South African, you know, disability activist and scholar, has presented a model on this also, uh, in which he has uh, given the three phases uh, of uh, the, the way disability has evolved, you know, uh, which goes with the, almost all the models, like the charity model, then the, uh, you know, the, or to say religious model, then a medical model and then a social model and now cultural model. So uh, my question is, how do you take uh, these things? Like, according to you, uh, are there really material conditions which are presenting? Obviously, the, 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 will, the answer will be or the response will be somehow yes. But what, what is your take on it, this? That's my question. Uh, Thank you yeah, so much. When I, when I mentioned the British, I, I sort of added Dick Finkelstein. He was a very important uh, um, aspect of it. So look, um, you know, I, I am, I am by birth and by, uh, um, you know, pr uh, persuasion uh, on the left and I, a Marxist. Uh, so I understand the argument and you're talking about base and superstructure and the, the material conditions. And I, I think that that, um, I think that that explains a lot in society. Um, but disability you know, kind of has an uneasy fit with that. Uh, so like, I remember Mike Oliver in one of his books was arguing that disability should be, you know, that that was disability was, you know, people with disabilities were kept down so that they could be part of the, you know, reserve labor army that capitalism would use, you know, in case uh, they needed scabs or, you know, someone to fill in for workers. And that, that struck me when I read that, I thought that is just totally wrong. <laughs> you know, that, um, that, that uh, uh, that's not what's going on. And, and in fact, it, if you look at it, you know, people with disabilities don't serve that function. They're not part of the reserve labor army. They never get to work uh, if they do. You know, they're not filling in for uh, workers. You know, they're not so that prices can be kept down. Um, it's just not the case. So, so yeah. I mean, I think that you could say that, uh, like many other oppressed people, people with disabilities are oppressed by capitalism. But I don't think that disability. That, I don't think that capitalism creates necessarily uh, uh, the category of of disabling disablement. Nor would, so the other alternative would be to say like, well, if we lived in a truly revolutionary society where there was complete economic justice and everybody was equal, would there still be discrimination against people with disabilities? And there's nothing inherently in the, in the idea of economic redistribution or, you know, worker control of factories or whatever that, that would necessarily change the conditions under which people with disabilities are discriminated against. I mean, you could say that in an enlightened society, there would be no more discrimination against people with disabilities. It's possible to say that, but I'd like to see a stronger argument. Thank you, Professor. Thank you for the question. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Samit, Samit Chaturvedi has a question. Samit, please. Hi, Professor. Uh... Samir this side. Uh, I want to ask uh, you two questions. First, in general university system, disability studies per se, the status it has acquired uh, or its non-existence, uh, like do you think uh, other studies pertaining to margin, marginalities such as ethnic studies, race studies, 
gender studies also contributes to the marginalization of disability studies because a uh, few days back i was i attended uh, 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 farewell functions uh, my center organized uh, jnu ctplsc socially department organized for a professor and i asked you guys are talking about practice of sociology but where is disability studies in indian sociology uh this is first question and second question uh, is to do with uh, one of the responses i got during my field work uh, like my respondent said that uh, like i i asked him do you think uh, uh, all over the world and specifically in india in 2016 government have passed new disability law uh, if nothing it has strengthened uh, strengthened the voices of disabled or the bond between disabled he he kind of rejected my argument saying that what i would do uh, with this bonding if the judiciary system does not support disability laws the way or disability rights the way they should do he he told me that he is a petitioner and the way disability is conceptualized within courts it is still lies within medical model so these are and the third question third question if time permits like i find within university sorry sorry within university system like people and because i am from sociology sociology social anthropology uh, people read goffman people read foucault but still i see this say, like there is attitudinal problem within contemporary academic who engage uh, with marx foucault goffman these are with disability like my, uh, let me share my personal uh, anecdote with you and it is not, i i understand a uh, person's choice and everything so there is no nothing like i am not uh, angry about my personal grievances but my proposal was rejected proposal as in i i really liked the girl and i proposed her she was researching upon erwin goffman and her his uh, contribution to, towards uh, total institution okay so uh, my, uh, her rejecting me like i take it as her personal choice but it it generated a question within me that how far doing academic is liberating for them like for me it is because disability is my location like when i read something i connect with it yeah okay you asked me three questions and um i'm at an age where uh, i remember a couple of them <laughs> but uh i i think the 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 first question you were asking is about you know ethnicity and how that should figure in with disability and i and obviously this is where intersectionality comes in i mean uh you know it's one thing to be disabled it's another thing to be an ethnic minority or, and when those things are combined the discriminatory effects are exponentially increased so you know uh a, a, a person black trans uh you know deaf blind uh mobility impaired person is going to get a lot of dis- uh, uh, you know who's also gay is going to get a lot more discrimination against them um so yeah it's really important to uh do this kind of intersectional work and link them up um i think the other thing you were just saying is like 
I think you were echoing the thing that we wrote about in the introduction to the to 1995 thing uh, and really asked about well, what if there was no disability studies? You're saying you want to include disability studies in the work that you're doing and you want to like, you know, and people who are doing Foucault think like, well, why do we need disability? Foucault covers everything, you know? And I, and I think that that's the work that needs to be done here. This conference, you guys, everything you're doing is to, is to say, no, wait, actually this is something that needs to be included because it adds. It's not that it's just an add on. It's that it changes the nature of, the, of what we're talking about when we talk about discourse. All right, and for example, with Foucault, you know, his work on madness, you know, he did that in isolation. I mean, he was in, in Sweden, I think, for the whole, uh, the whole time he wrote that book, and he didn't, have, he didn't have a lot of resources. A lot of stuff in the uh, Madness and Civilization book that's fantastic, and a lot of it that's just dead wrong. And um, a lot of people in the, who are uh, people with uh, cognitive and affective disorders are, 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 have written about, you know, the, the, the way that these things are wrong, um, and wrong in serious ways. Uh, so, um, so yeah, this is, the whole point is that the disability perspective will change the nature of how we do Foucault or others like that. And I think you have a right to take it personally, and you have a right to take it personally on behalf, if this is possible, on behalf of disability studies. Thank you. Uh, I think if I move on, there's a question that Samir asked, and there's another one that Bilby has asked. Uh, which is which ties to it. Do you think that non disabled researchers need to step back uh, and put the spotlight on disabled researchers so that disabled researchers can be Now, this is kind of an identity politics question. Um, look, I'm not a disabled person. And uh, the reason I got involved in this is because my parents were deaf. So I am a coder. That is something that I am. But I'm not, you know, and I. And I remember way back in the beginning, I, I mentioned to David Mitchell, I said, you know, I'm not disabled. I mean, should I step away from this? And he said, no, we don't want to ghettoize this, this profession. Um, and, you know, I think, so look, if it, so here, it, it's a complicated question. I don't want to, I don't want to, you know, anecdotally like answer it, but uh, um I still am enough of an academic to believe that if the work is good, uh, then it's good work. Um, so there's certainly a role for uh, a conversation because I learned so much from people. With, you know, the other thing that's important is that, look, disability, what is it? It's like a million different things. So like, yeah, you could have a mobility impairment. Or does that mean you understand obesity? You know, I mean, you could... Uh, be blind. Does that mean you understand that someone who's got an invisible disability, uh, 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 a diabetic, someone with fibromyalgia? In other words, we're all improvising in disability studies. We're all trying to learn from each other. We're, we're all, we're, we have a kind of fiction that disability is one thing, but in reality, it's not. So, you know, it is one thing and it's not one thing. It's like a mystery. It's like the Trinity, you know, it's three and one, you know. So disability has this as, a, as its basis, a kind of, you know, uh, act of faith. So, yes, it's really important that the people who have disabilities have a voice, are part of it, change the nature of the dialogue. But does that mean that someone else should just leave because they don't have a disability? I don't know. I, I mean, I don't have a quick answer to that. I mean, if I had left, I don't know, there'd be a lot of work that I wouldn't have done. And there'd be a lot more work in 18th century novel studies. I don't know. <laughs> uh, thank you. Sanket asks, I want to understand how the fashioning of norm takes place in contemporary times when, men, when, when mental illness, in brackets, psychic conditions, and neurodivergence have become an identity choice for an increasing number of people who are economically comfortable and at the same time do not fit into any other identity category marked by a disenfranchised biological trait, for example, Black, LGBTQ, physically disabled, and so on and so forth. Wait, uh, that was a complicated question. Is it on the chat thing? Yeah, it's, 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 it's on the chat. It's on the chat. Some kids are not. Just right. scroll up. It begins with it's a privilege to listen to you. So. I'm sorry, I don't see it. Um, 
Is it in the very beginning? Somewhere. I mean, a couple of, one message um, above multiples. Okay, I, I understand the question, I think. So, um, so the question is, how does the idea of norm fit in with something like neurodiversity? I think there was an, uh, then there was an ac aspect of the question about, you know, is like the neurodiverse movement kind of uh, middle class and how would that affect people who are not? Is that kind of the gist of it? Did I get that right? I don't so know what, what I'm asking. So, I mean, she's basically asking how does one think of the norm when mental illness or what well, mental illness has become something that people ascribe to now, especially those who are economically comfortable because those who are not economically comfortable. Yeah, I mean, I, I wrote a book called Obsession and History, which might be interesting to the questioner, um, in which I talk about OCD and other um, uh, aspects of psychic distress. And, um, you know, so actually, I, I, there was a slide I could have included um, in the talk. When you deal with, with mental issues, uh, it's a little bit difficult because like, for example, the impairment, uh, the impairment disabled model doesn't quite work so well because, and this is one, by the way, one of the critiques of the impairment uh, disabling model is that it, it doesn't, the, the impairment side is not questioned, right? In other words, you need a medical diagnosis and we don't question the medical diagnosis. With psychiatric uh, diagnoses, you, you, there's much more ground for questioning them. Um, you know, the, the way that the, the, di the DSM, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual that lists all of the psychiatric disorders is, you know, it, it is a document itself of great, you know, um, uh, you can ask a lot of questions about it because it's, it's done by committee, it changes all the time, it's probably US centered. Um, there's a very interesting book, by the way, called Crazy Like Us which uh, talks about how uh, US and uh, Northern countries have exported their diag you know, psychiatric diagnoses to the rest of the world in a, in a kind of imperialist colonialist way. And um, so, so I think we, you know, so I think that uh, you, 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 ha you have to start out by questioning the diagnoses themselves and how they fit in with concepts of the norm. So like, for example, I, the work I did on OCD, uh, there, there was in the DSM-5, two diagnoses. One was called obsessive compulsive disorder, and the other is called obsessive compulsive personality disorder. And the obsessive compulsive disorder is there's a lot of ways to diagnose it, but the simple thing is to say is that you're doing, you're either you're doing things or you're thinking things over which you have no control and you don't like it. You, you wished you weren't doing it, um, and, but you, you're helpless, you can't stop. Um, obsessive personality, uh, uh, obsessive compulsive personality disorder, same exact thing. You're doing the same things, but you're okay with it. You know, it's just who you are, that's how I am. Um, so that actually tells us so much about the social construction of certain kinds of uh, psychiatric uh, disabilities, because what makes someone happy or unhappy about their behaviors? You know, is it, a, is it your partner who's telling you, why are you washing your hands all the time? That's horrible, you should stop doing that. Is it, or your mother, <laughs> you know, uh, or, or um, you know, it, is it society at large that tells you that it's a bad idea to be cleaning surfaces uh, constantly? Of course, I said during the pandemic, all of that changes. Um, so you can see that, 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 that the complexity of the diagnosis itself is one thing. Um, yeah, when you come up, and I think the neurodiversity movement raises questions about norms. Uh, like what, is it abnormal to, um, to be autistic? Uh, or is it simply one aspect of being a human being? Some people are autistic, some people are artistic, I mean, or both. Um, so. And then, in, and just in terms of the the how this affects various classes, I think that was kind of a, a thought in there. Um, um, obviously, people p classes that can speak with authority and have authority within society, gatekeeping intellectuals, uh, people who have who are influencers, can have a huge effect in in the long run on the way the society at large can considers various things. I think we've seen that in the US at least about autism and uh, people on the spectrum uh, in the last 10 years 
who have moved from being like crazy to being different um, or being, you know, and a lot of times, I mean, I, I didn't talk about this at all. And I think a number of you mentioned it, the role of culture, uh, you know, media is terribly important in these things. You know, that like we can talk about being a Marxist and changing the economic conditions. We can talk about civil rights and changing those. But at the end of the day, the daily micro interactions between people really determine the nature of how you feel in the world. And those things are not subject to legislation and they're probably not even subject to a revolution. They are, they are the result of a slow evolution through, um, the, the, through, through the media of the way that people with disabilities are treated. Um, so the more people we see in the media who have disabilities, the more that plots are centered not on the disability, but on something else. So that in reality, I mean, I always use the example, like in a movie, if a woman is pregnant, it's part of the plot. It's gotta mean something. In real life, when a woman is pregnant, it doesn't mean anything. She's just the same woman who happens to be pregnant. Um, same thing with the disability. If you see a disability in a movie and the whole plot has to revolve around the disability, that's a very different world from one where there's a disabled person who's going about their business in the movie and that's not the plot of the movie. So I, I do think that culture representations in novels, theater, uh, movies, TV, all of that will have a kind of a, a dripping, drip, drip, drip effect on the way that people welcome or interact on in a, a daily basis in a social way with disabilities. And by the way, the, you know, the issue about like, should people with disabilities or uh, should people without disabilities step back? I mean, I think this is also the case, like when you start going, I mean, conferences like this uh, is where you start learning about other people's disabilities. Um, it's not like you're born with that knowledge. And it's not like you have that knowledge if you have a particular disability. It's through the kind of comfortable interactions with people that you can stop the issues around staring and, you know, uh, the obtrusiveness of that. And you can also learn about what life is like with a variety of disabilities. I mean, I've learned so much from going to conferences and having friends uh, as just as being part of, of, of the, uh, this disability world community. Thank you. I think we are running out of time. So I'll take just one last short question. Uh, just to make ah. Last question, please. Ah, last question. One last short question that Chibangi has put up. The pandemic has overturned, overturned so many definitions of norms. How does disability studies respond to these new realities? Um, sorry, is that is that the last question on the? Yes, I mean no, it's not the last question there, but I we do not have any more time. Uh, can you repeat the question, please? If the pandemic has overturned so many definitions of normalcy. How does disability studies respond to these new realities? Um, what was the first two words I missed? The pandemic has overturned so many definitions. Oh, the pandemic. Oh, the pandemic. Yeah. Well, I mean, I wrote a piece which is online if you want to read it. Uh, but just briefly, what I say there is that, you know, um, I think that, uh, in, I mean, just to put it very simply, I think we've all become disabled. I mean, I don't like the, that kind of broad general argument, but I think we have all become disabled in the sense that we all become vulnerable. We all understand, and when I say we all, I mean thinking people who are caring about this. Um, we all realize that we're incredible, as humans, we're just an incredibly vulnerable species. There are so many microorganisms and weather conditions and et cetera that want to kill us and that want to uh, harm us. So I think we've all, there's that sense of a kind of communal vulnerability. Um, I think we also have new respect for uh, government and processes that help us. And therefore, this kind of fantasy of independence and lack of dependence that we have, that in countries like the US, you know, who, who value possessive individualism, uh, you know, people are realizing like, no, we're not individuals. And, and I think even globally, that's true because like, you know, Australia can totally shut itself off from everybody else, but no one's gonna be healthy until the poorest person in the poorest country ha is vaccinated. So, um, you know, so this sense of, of, of the vulnerability, the, the need for, for help, uh, caretaking, we're not independent. We, you know, I think that all is very positive. And then I think, shout out for people with OCD uh, who have shown us that, you know, 
those behaviors, at least in terms of germs and viruses, are not not are not unproductive. I have like a pet theory, which I totally can't prove, that um, you know that it, it, evolution favored those who were uh, more had more OCD um, because they were the ones that would survive pandemics. Uh, as opposed to the carefree, you know, let's go out and have fun people. Um, so yeah, I think that uh, um, I think that the pandemic has taught us so much, but has also endangered us. And so by endangering us, it's also endangered everybody with a disability, and particularly uh, heightened eugenic concerns and discrimination. So not all positive, but yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Davis. I think I shall not take any more time because we're taught right on 7.30. And I should hand it back to Sumesh sir to wrap things up. I would like to say that if anybody does have a question and they want me to answer it, I'm very active on in, on Gmail. So um, just write to me at my my, uh, my my university email is Len Davis L E N. I'll just put it in the in the chat. Yes. And if you want to reach me, you can do that. Thank you, Ritwik, for uh, moderating the session. And I am terribly sorry, Professor Davis. There is a, an endless number of questions waiting to be answered in the chat box, but we are constrained by time. It is past 7.30, but thank you for giving such a illuminating lecture. And what really fascinated me was your autobiographical bit. That is something that we would have never known and never come across had you not shared it with us today. It was a great and exhilarating experience for us to listen to you. We had read you for years now, but listening to you is a memorable experience. Thank you for giving us a very brief but nuanced outline of how disability studies emerged from a world where there was no disability studies and how it evolved over the years to become a global dis discipline. Thank you so much, Professor Davis. And I really hope you give us the opportunity to connect in future and the opportunity to host you once again. Thank you. Thank you so Thank you. much. Thank you.